Welcome to the Creative Breakthrough. I am your host, Shireen Kassam, aka The Funny Brown Girl. Thank you so much for tuning in. If this is your first time, welcome. You're in for a treat. If you are a uh, dedicated listener to this podcast from day one, you're an OG. I can't thank you enough. I am so grateful for you. Um, while you guys are listening to this podcast, a uh, huge favor to ask you, hit that share button. If you're listening to this podcast on your phone right now, on your mobile device, your smart device, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, hit that share button, share it to your social media, share it with a friend who might enjoy this. Let other people know about this podcast because that's how more and more people find out about this podcast. And I love it, love it, love it when more and more people are getting use and getting the advice they need from this podcast. The whole idea behind this podcast is to provide you mentorship, to give you that informal mentorship that maybe you don't have, to learn how to become an actor, how to become a screenwriter, how to become a film producer, and not just become them, but be, be successful at it, win at it, be the best at it. And so that's why I find the guests that I do to help us all elevate our creative journeys. And trust me, I get as much out of these conversations as I hope you guys are getting out of these conversations. So let's continue that uh, momentum and let's keep sharing this podcast. Uh, write a review if you can. Those also really help us find more listeners as well. So I also want to just say thank you from the bottom of my heart to those of you who for tuning in because without you, this podcast would not be what it is. Um, I know I think last week we were trending in Nigeria. We're still trending in Nigeria. We're now trending in India as well and Lebanon. So I've lost track of how many countries we are in the top 100 podcasts for, but it is growing every week and I love it because that just means we're impacting people all over the world. And like, that's just, that is such a great feeling, especially right now when there's not a lot to feel hopeful for. The idea is like, we can feel hopeful that we're still working on our art. We're still working on our creative passions and we're still elevating ourselves. And so that's really awesome that you guys are using this time productively. So this week, we continue our conversation with the founder of Deaf Comedy Jam, Bob Sumner. But I also want to tell you guys a little bit about how the rest of the season is going to go before we jump in. This season, I want to spend a lot, about, a lot of our time talking about how to monetize your creative passion, how to create side hustles, how to basically make money doing what you love. And I know a lot of people say to me, but if I love it, I shouldn't have to make money from it. Can it just be something I love? And like, can I just not do it on the side alongside my real job? You totally can. But here's the thing for a lot of us, I would hope that you would want to make your creative passion, your, your love for something into your real hustle, into your full-time gig. And to do that, you need to make money so that you can buy food and put a put a roof over your head. Um, it also goes to show you like if you start charging for your art that you value your art, you, there's value to what you're doing. And so I understand like you want to give it, give it away for free because either you're new to the performance space or the art space or because you don't want it to be your full-time job. But at the end of the day, you also need to put value on what that art is. On the flip side, if you are somebody who say is like a, a high profile lawyer, right? And you have all this money coming in and then you decide to go be a musician and now you're going to say yes to gigs for free. Think about all the musicians out there who are actually need the money, who are doing this full time. And so by you saying you're going to do it for free, you've set a new precedence now. So now the producers of those shows are always going to come to you to do those shows because you're going to do it for free and you're putting out people from work who really need that money. So it's, it's, it's also a two sided street, right? You can't do things for free all the time because you're hurting the industry. You're hurting your other peers in the space in terms of what they can charge. Um, so don't always just look at it like it's my, it's my passion and it's something I love to do, but I don't want to make money out of it because you've also got to think about what money you're taking away from other people's plates. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about this right now because we're going to get into this in season two, but I wanted to put a little bit, a little bit of snippets out there or some advice out there because a lot of my coaching clients right now have been asking me this question. They're like, Shereen, the clubs in my city are opening up. The performance spaces in my cities are opening up and producers are calling them to come and perform and they don't want to pay them. And they're, they're saying that they're saying that we're in the middle of COVID. We can't, you shouldn't, you shouldn't ask for money. Like you should want to make people laugh. People need to laugh. People, people desire to laugh because it's been such a sad couple of months. And so you should do this for free. So this is the question you need to ask back when someone calls you or reaches out through, to you through social media to do a show or to perform or to display your art or to teach a class on something. 
are they getting paid? Is the producer charging for tickets? Is the producer charging for anything? Are they going to be making any money off of this? Because if they're making money, they're making money off of you. So you should also be making money. Does that make sense? You should be benefiting from the financial gains of this as well. Now, let me tell you something else. It is true. People need to laugh. It is true that people are depressed. It is true that there is a recession coming about, that people are struggling financially, that unemployment is the highest it's ever been. People are scaling back their spending. I understand that and I totally agree. But on the flip side, people are still making their monthly payments for their Netflix subscription, their Hulu, their Disney Plus. People are still going on Amazon and buying things they don't need. People are still ordering takeout, right? So there is that discretionary money people are still spending. So why should you charge less than you're worth? Netflix is not charging anything less. They're not giving a COVID discount. So you don't need to give a COVID discount. Now, I understand that you're like, well, they're not gonna pay me, but I really wanna be up there on stage. I really wanna be performing, like I, I'll do it for free. Yes, so you're gonna start doing it for free because of COVID, right? But what if COVID doesn't go away, right? What if COVID is here for, for a while? And I, I don't wanna sound like negative Nancy or depressing, but there's a chance COVID could be around for another year. So what, are you gonna go perform for free for a whole nother year? How are you gonna pay for your food? How are you gonna put a, a roof over your head? And I know some of you are like, well, I have a job. I had a job too. And then look what happened in April, I got my job went away and I didn't have a job anymore. And I was lucky that I had my comedy and I had my acting to lean on and this podcast to lean on to make money and to have money in my pockets, right? So you have to be prepared for the future and you have to be prepared for what's gonna happen. You also have to think about it this way. If you say you're okay not getting paid right now because of COVID, Right? Why should the producers pay you once COVID is over? Because they've been making money this whole time and you've been okay with it. So what changes once COVID goes away? They're still gonna be making money. Why should you start making money? So you've gotta think about this as a bigger picture. This is a long-term strategy, not just a short-term strategy, okay? Now, if you're new to the scene, like you're still trying to get your foot in the water, you're still trying to understand where you stand, then that's fine, go do shows for free, but, don't let people take advantage of you. Do not let people take advantage of you. That is the number one thing I tell artists and creatives. People are going to try to take advantage of you. They think that you're not smart. They're not, in, in, the, in the sense that you're not business savvy, that you're so dedicated to performing that they can, they can, they can pull a fast one on you. And they're gonna use words like, you're gonna grow your social media following. You're gonna get exposure. You're gonna meet a ton of people who might book you for another show. That is all fine and dandy, but that doesn't pay your rent and put a roof over your head, okay? So don't, don't let those people take advantage of you. Another thing to be wary of is that people are paying. There are people out there paying, paying for stuff, but the thing is that they're paying really, they're paying lower than the market value of what you're worth. And let me give you an example. So I do acting, I do acting for commercials. Now pre-COVID, you would come to me and say, I wanna put you in my commercial, Shireen. I'm gonna give you anywhere between 1,500 and 2,000 US dollars, right? And then in the contract, it'll say that they will only get to use your footage in the image of me for one year. That's called a buyout. It's a one year buyout for a commercial and you get $2,000, end of story. If after one year they wanna continue using your footage and your image, then they will renegotiate a contract with you. Now, today in COVID times, what's happening is that people are coming at me and saying, I want you to do this commercial. I'm only gonna pay you $400 and I wanna have the buyout for life. Meaning I can use your image and your video footage for as long as I want, all for $400. Now, here's the problem with that. These people, these companies, these Fortune 100 companies, these CEOs are gonna put out your face in this commercial, right? for $400 and they're going to get to keep using it over and over and over to generate revenue for themselves, to drive, in, to drive profit for themselves. And you get nothing from that. You get absolutely nothing. They are taking advantage of us and it is not fair, but there's not so much we can do upset. We can all boycott together. So what happens again in this situation is that people who value their art, people who value their talents are gonna say no. I'm not gonna let you use my image for a whole year, for more than a for more than a year, for a lifetime, right? But then there are people who are either new to acting or just so excited to have something, or maybe they really need the four hundred dollars, right? Like I can't blame you if you really need the four hundred dollars, and they're going to say yes, they're going to do it. Then what happens is that 
they will continue to put out these $400 auditions because now they know that people are going to accept $400. So there was no reason to pay $2,000. So do you see how that we drive the market down by accepting this kind of behavior? And so it's important for us to say, no, this is how much my talent is worth. Your talent is always worth what you believe it's worth. You do not have to give a COVID discount, okay? It is, it is nowhere written that a COVID discount is necessary right now. Now, if you feel like somebody says to you, like, I only have this much budget or I'm putting on a show, but I can't fill the whole room because of social distancing. Sure. So my, my going rate to do, to do a private show usually is anywhere between $500 and a thousand dollars. Now you're telling me you're not going to be able to fill up the whole banquet room. You can only have half those people. So yes, maybe I'll work with you. I'll try to figure out, okay, what are you still going to charge those people? How much is it going to cost you to rent the room? And maybe I'll give you some sort of discount because you're not going to have a full room there. But at the end of the day, I was going to do 30 minutes for a thousand dollars. I'm still going to do 30 minutes in a, in a, in a COVID time. So my time is still worth a certain amount of money. Does that make sense? So just because you can't fill the room with all those people, that's not my problem. My problem is, is that I need to get paid for the amount of work that I'm going to be giving you. So if I'm getting paid, like at my day job, right? Like say I'm getting paid $20 an hour. My boss isn't going to come in and say, Hey, Shireen, because of COVID, you were only serving, you were serving a hundred people uh, pre-COVID and now you're only serving 50 people. So I'm going to have to cut your salary by half. That's not how it works. Okay. Like that's just not the way business works. So just keep that in mind. Like they're not taking a cut in their salaries. You shouldn't be taking a cut in your salaries. So now are there times when you can perform for free? Sure. It's always at your discretion. I'm not here to tell you not to perform for free. I'm just here to tell you, remember what you're worth. Remember that your talent is worth something. Think about all the hours you've put practicing. Think about all the hours you've put creating. Think about all the hours you put in that you could have been spending time with your friends or family, right? What I'm saying is to think about is that if you are given an opportunity to gain exposure in front of hundreds of people for free, well, then that's just an opportunity that someone is trying to take advantage of you. And trust me, I know I've been there. I've been taken advantage of. That is why I'm sharing this with you because I'm smarter. I'm wiser. I know better now. Okay. So this week I continue my conversation with Bob Sumner. Now we did the, we had a conversation that I shared with you two weeks ago on the last episode. And this is just a continuation of that because it was an hour and 45 minute conversation. And I didn't want to throw up the whole hour and 45 minutes two weeks ago, because I really wanted you to listen to the first episode and take away the takeaways and really just start implementing them in your life. And he gave some really helpful advice. He, gave, he dropped some, some gems, a lot of knowledge. A uh, couple things he talked about is like, how did he come up with the vision to create Deaf Comedy Jam? What does he look for in talent? And what is his advice to creative? So definitely go back and listen to that episode if you haven't already. This week is going to be a continuation of that conversation. Now, if you don't know who Bob Sumner is, Bob is known as the co-creator of HBO's Russell Simmons Deaf Comedy Jam, a recognized force in the world of comedy and the man behind most comedy legends. With over 25 years of experience, Bob has discovered many of the top gifted comedians that have graced the stages and big screens around the world, including Kevin Hart, Bill Bellamy, Mike Epps, Dave Chappelle, Cheryl Underwood, Chris Tucker, Cedric the Entertainer, and Bernie Mac. Bob is the executive partner in Laugh Mob Enterprises, which has produced specials that have aired on Showtime, DirecTV, and On Demand. He is also the executive producer of Laugh Mob's We Got Next and Laugh Mob's Laugh Tracks. What are we waiting for? Let's get started. So what advice do you have for creatives on their journey? Keep creating. Just keep keep stabbing at it. And, and, and um, for comedians, keep writing, especially now. You know, but even when I look at like how laugh tracks got on television and things like that, take advantage of social media. Take advantage of putting something together, whether it's three minutes, 15 minutes. Look at Issa, Insecure. Yeah. I mean, all of that has happened right on social media. And these are things that we didn't have back in the day when I was coming up in this business, you know, it was on the grind. And that's why I got to continue to be on the grind, you know, but that's mm -hmm. what it is. It's all about believing in what you want to do straight up. So you're in Orlando. Okay. I am. Yep. How often are you getting around when you get back in it? Do you come up to the New York area? 
I do. I've uh, I've had I've had good luck getting into New York, Chicago. Um, I haven't done LA as much as I would like, but yeah, Toronto. I've done quite a few. LA is not all. Um, LA is not yeah, all. Yeah, the East Coast. LA. Yeah. <laughs> LA is hit hit and miss for me. <laughs> when I when I look at the climate of it and what they're what they're doing out there, you know. But you but you, I believe that you can work out there because you got something to say. You know, a lot of them out there is just mm -hmm. out there throwing it up in the air and seeing if what sticks. You know. So. Let me know if you go that way. I was actually thinking it was. Well, yeah. So that was it. Was actually in the plans. It was September of 2020. I was supposed to make a move. I hadn't decided though, LA or New York. I'm still like up in the air about it. But now I think that's right. Gonna be but either way, keep me posted on that. Okay. Do you have a Do you have any thoughts of where it's better to go? I kind of do. I kind of do. I mean, <laughs> I think New York is New York stand up wise is the way to go. You know, initially, mm -hmm. initially, okay. initially. And then you can always go to LA and, and you know, just figure out your, when you're going to LA and spend, you know, set up, set up before you go. But go and have people come out to see you and things like that. That's what LA is more for. But in terms of grinding and working it out, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. And then when you finally yeah. do get to LA during those times, if somebody offer you like you can be a regular at the store or something like that, that's what makes you want to step. You know what I mean? Other than that, right. you know, yeah. But I, 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 I yeah. have no doubt no, sense. that if you apply yourself in one of those two places it will happen for you because you have the talent you know what i mean mm -hmm. you didn't just get mm -hmm. to the well, comedy wings final just because you got there you know what i'm saying you had the talent to get there yeah well i appreciate that thank you yeah somebody's asking about the peppermint, the peppermint? lounge back in the days really the peppermint yeah, was the, the peppermint. spot i mean it's, it's crazy because when, when, when we talk about like the beginning of Def Comedy Jam, like right now we're working out, um, we got some projects in the works, but one is really telling the story, not in a documentary form, but an actual like sitcom slash drama, like a dramedy somewhat of the Peppermint. This place, the Peppermint, everybody worked there. Cheryl Underwood drove from California to Orange, New Jersey, just to perform at the Peppermint so she can get on Def Comedy Jam. Wow. And there's a story there that I'll talk about in the documentary about all of that. But there's a lot of people. Chris Spencer was just talking about the Peppermint. Said was talking about the pepper. Everybody talks about. It. Everybody came through the peppermint, so it, it it was like everybody. Shaquille O'Neal and Queen Latifah, like that was the spot where they would hang. Naughty by nature. It was like they was in there. Like OPP was brand new. Hip Hop Hooray was brand new, and they in there playing the record. DJ Corey <laughs> was awesome, you know. So Bill Bellamy was my host and. When Bill went to MTV, uh, replaced him uh, with Mike Epps, you know, and you never know who was going to perform in, in the Peppermint. Then you had singers like Joe and Jaheem and Carl Thomas. They would just like sing with the band. And then it was the after party. And then there was food like oxtails. And one time Michael Kaya bought my mother <laughs> a whole coconut cake <laughs> from the place. So, yeah. The, the the peppermint was uh, the peppermint was crazy, word up. But you had to be funny. You you wasn't coming in the peppermint, just <laughs> messing around. You know what I mean? And then the next thing you know, you was on on Def Comedy Jam. You know my man Ice Cold, he's checking us out right now, and um, he was a heavyweight. He was a championship boxer that used to come through, and he had belts. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. A little bit of everybody wow. used to come in the peppermint. Yeah, Wendy Williams. Wendy Williams <laughs> used to come in there wilding out. It was crazy. Yeah. 
when you was asking me about what did I want my legacy to be, and again, you know, yeah. I had mentioned earlier when I was going down to Howard University and stuff, and I met John Johnson from Johnson Publishing. He just he just inspired me. He inspired me, and as well as Barry Gordy. You know, when I look at the things that they've done, and it made me say that if there's something, one thing that I really want to do is I want to have an entertainment conglomerate. You know, I want to have a building where I can employ my friends and my family who have expertise in something, you know, whether they're, you know, in the culinary arts, if they're into cosmetology, if they're electricians, if they're, you know, it's more to the entertainment business than just, you know, behind the camera or in front of the camera. And, you know, have a studio there where they can create, make music. That's what I want to do. I want to have a building. Call it Sumner Time. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That would be dope, <laughs> you know? And what I'm most excited about, I'm really excited to hear, because everyone knows that I, I listen to comedians live. I don't really watch footage, you know, maybe like with you, with the ABFF, you know, I would look at footage because it was a competition. But other than that, I, I like to watch live sets because that that makes me feel like I'm right there. If you're nervous, you know, I don't need to be putting the cameras on you because like I remember when Lucille Ball and, and Jackie Gleason on their sitcoms when they would do the commercials and they would get nervous and things like that or Fred Flintstone, I don't need you to do that. That's why I'm into like live, mm -hmm. live performances. And I'm really looking forward to these new sets because everybody has to come with new sets right now. I mean, I don't even, I ain't checking for none of that. If I start hearing comedians talk about that old stuff, you know, unless I never saw them before, but anybody that I've seen before, you, got, you can't take me back there. Not now. I know you, got, you, you have to reset. You know? What else would you be looking for other than new material? Like as somebody in the audience, what else are you what else are you hoping they bring to the stage or she? Just a, 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 a an original pr perspective on things. You know what I mean? I was uh actually just having a conversation with somebody recently about um years ago I was up at a club um in, in New York called the Crane Club. All right, I was actually up there with Russell and Q-Tip, right? And Kenny, Kenny, Kenny Lee, um, the our driver. Um, wow, something happened. Here. Hold on, back. Um, Kenny Lee, the driver. Uh, we was riding, going downtown, and Tip asked Russell a question about what is it that makes him like choose an artist and russell couldn't have been more clearer than the same way i feel when i see a comedian it's about originality it's about seeing something that you never saw before that's when you know that you saw it you know not mm -hmm. a re a, a reboot of someone else's set you know because sometimes i go to a comedy show and it's like i've seen that guy he just got screw his head off put somebody else's head up there. You know what I mean? So, yeah, that was one of the things. I just want to talk about you for a second, about how funny you are, like, as a stand-up comedian. Thank you. And when you were a finalist in the, um, the um, Comedy Wings competition, it's like, you know, you're down there in Orlando, Florida, but New York City and Los Angeles is really calling for you, Shereen. And when you when you get ready to make yeah. those moves, <laughs> let me know because I'm not just saying this. You are funny. You have mm -hmm. what it is is you're very very intelligent. Like I could see you on the Daily Show. Seriously, with Trevor. Oh my God, that's really? like my dream. That is like that is the dream. Yeah, I've 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 stopped him so many times. I've said I like, just lost. Packets. You know, we lost a, um, <laughs> a great comedian and a great friend recently, Angela Lazada. Angelo was Trevor's uh, traveling act, his feature. And if Angelo oh, yeah, was ahead. still here, I would get off the phone right now and call him to tell him 
about you, okay? And, and if somebody's listening right now that knows how to get to Trevor Noah, tell them that Bob Sumner, who has found many, many funny people, has one right <laughs> here that Trevor Noah need to see. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I actually had the privilege, it was funny, I did what you just did. I was in Cape Town this at this time last year performing in Cape Town. And every time I got on stage, I was like, if anyone here is related to well, it, Trevor it Noah, happens. It come happens. And Corey, see me. Corey Bell from <laughs> Chicago, she's the opening act for Monique. And she spoke mm -hmm. it up. She spoke it into, you know, happening. So it, it can happen. Sunny, yeah. hey, Sunny. With, uh, with Trevor. That's the crazy part about my life, though. At the end of the day, it's like I might know more celebrities than anybody at, at the end of the day because of the different avenues that I've, I've, I've been traveling over the years. And I just sit back and I marvel at, at people, you know, when they find out who I am because when I meet them at first, they don't even want to talk to me. And then somebody else walk up at me and then all of a sudden, they my best friend. I'd be like, man, you had me at hello. <laughs> you know, it's really crazy. I love it. As long as you remember me, when I'm walking down the streets of New York, you won't be like, who's this crazy Muslim trying to attack me? Because that's what <laughs> happens in Florida. <laughs> Trust and believe me, you are definitely one of the funniest comedians there is out here. And that's that's what I like about what I do. I never forget my brother, okay? My brother was promoting the shows, and he does. He's a promoter down in Florida, mm -hmm. down on the, on the west coast of Florida. So, you know, we was doing shows with Mike Epps and Dominique and Bruce Bruce and them back in the day, Red Grant and all of them. So one day he had called me, and he was asking me who was, like, the next guy, Right. And I was telling him about this one guy and he started going around asking him, you know, people and the people was like, I heard of him, but this, that, and the other, right? Then my brother called me one day and said, Bobby, I should have just went on and did it, right? I said, I know, Kevin Hart's killing him now, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was like crazy, but that's how it's always been. Yeah, It's always yeah. been like that with me. It's like, I see them before, mm -hmm. like everybody, when they marvel at Chris Tucker, you know, it's like, there's this Chris Tucker story. There's a Mike Epps story. There's definitely a Bill Bellamy story, of course. And so many other ones. Ricky Smiley talks about it all the time, you know? And that's why I'm really, really into the next generation because it's really, really time. And here's something else. It's some women out here Right now, it's like, I can name five women, I'm not gonna name them, but there's five women right now that are probably in my top 10. Wow, that's right cool. Right now. That's good, yeah. No, it's real. Yeah. I'm just looking, I'm just looking for a platform for them. And that's why when we get back, like Kid Capri and I, we've been doing these showcases in, the, in Greenwich Village. You know, we're getting that vibe from when Pryor used to be in the village and when Jimi Hendrix would be recording in the village. We're creating that vibe because we want to bring comedy back to New York City mm -hmm. because the energy that we had in Deaf Comedy Jam days are unmatched. When you look at the, on Kevin Hart's LOL and you see the whole Deaf Comedy Jams, them audiences, those was no sound bites. That was all real. Right. You know, and even with your host, with the way Martin brought it. And you got to remember when Martin was our host, Nobody really knew who he was besides, you know, he was in House Party and what's what's happening now. But Def Comedy Jam took him to a place where he never left, mm -hmm. you know? So that's what's happening. 